right. Gary Jamat. Good to see you Glad again. Glad to huh? have you here. Thank you, thank you. It's a pleasure. I hope we can get some illuminating secrets from you today. And I'm going to give it all up today. <laughs> all up? Okay. All up. All right. I don't know if that's possible, but we're going to try. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've been playing together a number of years. I'd say it's about nine years already, and um, I spent about eight years before that wishing I could be playing with you. <laughs> and the reason was I used to listen to these gr great records by people I idolized, like B.B. King and Aretha Franklin and King Curtis, and I heard these bass lines that they stuck out and they were melodic and I could sing them and memorize them. Plus, I lived next door to a guy who practiced them for an entire year. That also helped. But, um, but they, were, they were so unique and, and just really stood out. And um, yet, you're totally locked into the groove. You're truly the groove master. I know you've got that, you've, you've had that uh, title for a while and it's true. It's really true. You've got your own fantastic style that, of course, has been emulated by many greats that have gone on to, you know, go another direction. That's what we hope to do with this tape, too, is to develop, you know, help students out there develop their own style. But they've got to know where it all came from. Now, where did it come from with you? How did you get started? Who did you listen to? Um, you know, like that. What, what, what can you say about that? Um, I hope you have enough tape. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how I got started? I got started playing the um, upright bass. Right. I used to listen to, I listened to Paul Chambers and that. Uh -huh. Who did he play with? He, he was playing with, Ma with the Miles Davis group. Okay. And I just found out just recently that he, when I heard him, he had just joined the group, approximately. At I that time. Him, I heard him in 1957, mm -hmm. and he had just joined the group in '56. So I caught, you know, whatever albums he recorded. I caught him at an early age, and this it really inspired me. And so I started playing the acoustic bass, and mm -hmm. I played classical music to learn the bass. And after playing for a year, I started working, playing in different bands, playing uh, club dates. And you told me you used to take the bass sometimes on the subway. On the, the big, sub the big the upright. big upright bass. Wherever I had to go, the bass went with me. You gotta be know. big to do that. I was always a big kid. You know, I was about <laughs> probably like close to six feet at the time, I would imagine. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. at 12 years old, 11 years old. <laughs> so it was, um, that's a lot, yeah. yeah. It was a lot to do, but I was had to see the support of my family. My mother was very, my mother was very um, supportive, so mm -hmm. that made it um, easy for me. So, do you feel that technique-wise, okay, when you made the shift over from, from acoustic bass, upright bass, to Fender bass, which was ar around when? Uh, uh, nine early years 60s? later. Not, so nine I, years later? Nine years later. Uh-huh. Actually, no, that's not true. I, in 64, I think I got a, a bass amp. Okay. So you're talking... Uh, it's about nine years later. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> I lose later. track of time. Yeah. Um, but um, the switch was made because of the music scene at the time. I didn't like what right. was happening. Right. And so I said, well, no, um, I want to play, play some music that would be more uh, responsive, the people would be more, people would be more <clears throat> responsive to. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I got into playing rhythm and blues music, which mm -hmm. I knew nothing about. Only from listening on the radio, which I didn't listen to, because I listened to jazz all the time, you know, mm -hmm. so... I had to learn how to play rhythm and blues and how to play the blues. And it, I just, uh, once I got into it, I felt I, had a, I felt I had a strong feeling for it as I did have a strong feeling for playing jazz. Well, it was still all around you, right? I mean, you grew up, you grew up in the Bronx. Not so right? much, though. It uh -huh. wasn't so much being all around me. I had to go, I had to go find it. Really? I had, to go, I had to actually go pursue it. When mm -hmm. I started playing electric bass, it came to me because I was playing in that type of music. Right. Uh, so I had to learn it. On the spot, basically. And yeah, says, no, yeah, you're yeah. playing too much. You're playing. No, don't right. play it like that. You know. So I had to sure. go through a lot. You know. Sure, I've been through that too. A lot yeah. of that yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of um, growing into playing rhythm and blues is much mm -hmm. more organized and um, disciplined. In fact, it's more repetitive. Mm -hmm. So you're playing the same thing over and over again. Right. Which I hadn't gotten used to. But there was a certain beauty right. in that which I learned to love, and I, I enjoy it. Well, I think therein lies one of your great secrets, though, is what you did with a lot of those rhythm and blues guys where you would, you know, you'd start with a, a, apparently sometimes sounding to the naked ear a very basic part, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden it starts becoming slightly, it gets the Jerry Jamat signature right away. Oh, yeah. And then it goes, can we have like, let, let's play a little something to demonstrate that. Oh, sure. Okay? Well, say if I was um, playing like, okay, I'm playing, here's the bass line. Now, see, this is the actual bass line. Right. No pickups, I'm playing on one and three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four.
pickups, lead-ins. Fill, pick up, fill, lead in. Yeah. See? Well, you see, what it does is, I know playing with you and hearing that a lot, it inspires the players to play on and push themselves into some other different directions, but you're mm -hmm. still holding down the groove. It's melodic. You can sing those parts, really. Mm -hmm. um, I hear a lot of major scale stuff in there, and a lot of... It, it sounds to me like you're definitely... You're thinking rhythm first. You know, you've got in your mind... If you've established a mm -hmm. simple thing like that, you're already swinging inside. You've already got all this stuff oh, going Oh, yeah, that feels on. good to me. It yeah. To feel, once I can play anything. Once it feels good... I try to start out simply and simple enough so that I can elaborate on it at any given point. Right. By way of using a pickup, mm -hmm. a lead-in, or a fill. And it's true, I do these things to excite the other people I'm playing with, to stimulate, right. to make it exciting, right. to make right. something happen, mm -hmm. and also to help it to um, develop. I also use, like, the setup, I can play a pattern like this. That's a one-bar pattern, repeat it. I can make it into a four-bar pattern, a two-bar pattern, or an eight-bar pattern, depending upon when I right. put the fill or the lead in and will mm -hmm. determine the length of the pattern, and also what I'm playing with. Mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. playing against a, a vocal or, a, or an instrumental melody. Right. Right. It's going to determine where I put the fills, the lead-ins, and the pickups. Right. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely noticed that you have... You, you have different approaches to, say, a solo section as opposed to a vocal section, as opposed to an intro or whatever. Or even, and, and you're a great soloist too, something a lot of people don't know about your playing. But um, what happens is it's kind of like a solo right from the very start. It's just something that people should realize out there is that from that very first note that you play, you're committed. You're, you've mm -hmm. committed yourself to what the rest of the th song is going to be from that point on. And uh, you, you're so great at that, you've really helped a whole generation of players um, to, feel, you know, to feel more of that, that kind of thing. Um, like, for example, I think we should, I'd like to play a little bit of something. It's one sure. of the favorite things that um, I ever heard you play on, which was The Thrill Is Gone, B.B. King's song. Okay. And uh, this was a real example to me of absolute simplicity, but yet... <laughs> You know, you're listening to a lead guitar player, but the bass is just as important and just as out there, even yeah. though it's holding down the Yeah, I call, that a, I call that a sub-melody. Mm -hmm. When you have a melody or a, a lyric or a melody itself, and you play accompaniment sub-melody to it. Right. So it doesn't get in the way, but it supports it. Right. They work, they're going to work hand in hand. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. All right. Okay. One, two, three. <laughs> Definitely not gone. That's <laughs> I can tell you. Who I you can run that all night. 
But you see, that's the thing. I heard you developing and getting more and more, and, and, and it was just more and more supportive. It wasn't all over the place. A lot of guys today, they, te they tend to start going right up into your range, you know, mm -hmm. guitar player's range or the horn player's range, and, and kind of blurring the whole thing. You, you know, you've got the art of that support down, the groove master. Okay. Uh, How'd you get that, that title? <laughs> who, who officially gave you that title? Well, from listening. Master? I guess from uh -huh. listening. That's what it came from, because I listen hard, hard to, um, mm -hmm. to everything that's going around me. Do you feel that you learned a lot? Like, you had a lot of big gigs at a very early age. Do you feel, I know I went through the same kind of yeah. thing. Do you feel that you learned a lot in front of people, in front of audiences, on the spot, in the studio, those kind of situations? Oh, yes. I respond well to pressure. I'm the type of, um, mm -hmm. I'm the type of person who, like, first of all, I hate to practice. I mean, <laughs> but I... Too busy working to I, practice, I, right? True. This is what happened. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I don't like to practice. I find myself practicing now in certain ways that are more mental than physical. Right. And then so I, certain types of practice I do that cover so much that is so um, intense yeah. that eliminates long hours of practice at this point. Because I'm not looking for physical dexterity. It's basically it's this muscle memory that I'm, you know, I'm constantly developing, as, sure. a, as opposed to physical endurance. Well, you were doing so much playing then. I mean, it was like session after session. And yes, you were I was constantly working. A kid, really, you know. But being under that pressure, it brings out the best in me. Right. And, and a lot of people right. feel that way also with, in terms of their own experience. The, a practice um, mm -hmm. pressure experience will bring out the best because you're forced to create on the spot and there's no going back mm -hmm. you know you have to constantly go forward now what about in those days okay you're, you're part of a lot of great rhythm sections but what about uh, when you when the famous section like with Purdy Bernard Purdy on drums Cornell Dupree on guitar Billy Preston you know and all those yeah, guys that was the Aretha tour we did with King Curtis with the King Curtis mm -hmm. and did you um, do you feel like those guys did they influence your style at all I mean I mean of course Purdy is also it seems to be like a real master in those embellishments and those he's very flashy of course yeah. but it just the, the, the way you work together was just incredible oh yeah it was a funny story when we first started working together it was like um, he taught me important concept years later but I didn't realize the drummer would listen to the bass player so heavily and I'm coming from a school of playing in a jazz situation where we listen to each other we never copied one another mm -hmm. everything was like separate Mm -hmm. And so it annoyed me the fact that he was always had his bass drum up my behind <laughs> every oh, really? time I play something. <laughs> he played along with me, you know. Oh, he was right there. Oh, he was yeah. right there, man. I could not lose him. I would try to lose him, and he was so fast and so quick. I couldn't <laughs> lose him to save my life. And I would jam myself up trying to lose him. So I finally said, I gave in. I said, oh, come on. Okay, we'll all ride together. Yeah, yeah. But I didn't realize this is what they people would call locking. Mm, okay? Exactly. And I lock in a different way. If I hear somebody playing something, I'll play something. Yeah. Counter to them. Mm -hmm. I might, you know, I might hit. We might hit at one point the same, the same beat. Right. But after that, this is about making it kind of weave together mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. one fabric. But you can see each thread individually. Mm -hmm. You don't lose the thread. You know, yeah. one fabric is one. You have yellow. You got green. Yeah. Well, he and yeah. you can still maintain. I can the see he thinks that way too. I know. Uh, I once did a session up in Atlantic, and I was there, and this guy was playing drums, and Bernard Purdy happened to walk by, and they said. Come on, you gotta bring in Bernard to watch this kid play. You know, I want I want you to see him. So the guy starts, he takes like about a 20 minute solo in front of Purdy. And Purdy's just standing there very cool watching. And then at the end he said, Well, so what's your advice? And Purdy said, You're gonna mess up your shoes playing that way. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing he said. Purdy just said, I just want to tell you one thing, you're gonna mess up your shoes and just take it easy. And that was it. And then he walked out and was like, I couldn't believe it. But but that's I guess that's the essence of his true uh, belief. But now he's, um, you know, but the thing is, okay, now when we did, we first met when we did um, Robert Johnson. The Robert Johnson, we did the first unknown Crossroads album. That's Hopefully right. someday it will be known. We did Great this Crossroads album. album in 1980, this Robert Johnson thing. And what we did, it was me, you, and Herbie Lavelle on drums. And Herbie Lavelle was a drummer on that B.B. King yes. stuff. And I was in seventh heaven because I'm sitting there saying, wow, I'm playing <laughs> with these guys who actually played on one of my heroes, you know, recordings. And um, he also had that art of letting you be where you had to be and laying back and he wouldn't mm -hmm. even hit two and four until oh, no. three or four minutes into the tune mm -hmm. you know but um, I guess different drummers you know you have different he's coming from a different, different background he's coming yeah. from a jazz background in fact Herb recorded the original record jumping with Symphony Sid I mean this is something like you know 
I used to listen when I was a kid, you know, so I mean, this guy's been around for a long <laughs> yeah, time. Yeah, sure. And so he's coming from that same, you know, that jazz orientation where every part is like different. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't, he wouldn't lock like Bram would like. He wouldn't lock the same way. We lock in different sure, ways. It would sure. be more maybe percussively with the cymbals and the snare drum. Mm -hmm. And he allowed me a lot of, um, you know, freedom. It's very loose playing with Herbie. And he'd make up a completely different part that nobody else would ever think about playing on the mm -hmm. drums. Well, you're very fortunate to play with a lot of artists, too. Oh, it's been who, a blessing. Who really feel, yeah, and, and that the groove, they knew that the groove and the band was what was really happening. Mm -hmm. And they probably let you guys go. You yeah. weren't so contained, so trapped, you know, the way sometimes a backup gig can be. Yeah. You know, and you got to explore rhythmically and, and all that. Now, when you, if you're working with a student, for example, now I know you're doing, you do a fair amount of uh, teaching still. Um, where do you get that, like, do you, where do you try to get them started? Like, what do you feel is the most important thing sh that they should first lock into if they want to get into developing their own style, their own technique? Mm -hmm. what, what kind of things? Well, the first thing they have to be able to do is understand the language of music, mm -hmm. understand what, what each sound means, the effect okay. of each sound, okay. by memorizing the scale, memorizing patterns, um, rhythmic patterns, mm -hmm. um, scale patterns, triads, which are patterns of thirds, mm -hmm. and then training the ear to hear music. And right. then when you combine that with the rhythm, they're able to make something out of it. It's like making up your own, voca making, make, make, creating your own vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so you want to be able to express yourself, express the same idea many different ways. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If I say blue, yeah. I want to hear blue. So if somebody right. might say, okay, this is blue. Okay, we'll say this is blue. Now, give me blue in Georgia. You see? <laughs> now, it makes you think, okay, blue in Georgia. Georgia South, okay, it's hot down there. So you want to say a composition. A, a hotter blue, yeah. okay? So you, have to, you, you learn to think. So you have to think about what musical phrase or pattern is going to make me recreate this blue in Georgia. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm thinking now blue in Georgia. <laughs> I got, into the, I got bluesy blue, mm -hmm. you know, more, it's more soul thing as opposed to, okay, blues in, no, blue in Nova Scotia, okay? <laughs> you're, not talking like, you're talking like North now, you're talking right. like, you know, I'm Canada, so you're thinking, okay, I'm thinking now I'm blues, you know, blue, the color blue sky, I'm thinking this kind of sky, so I'm thinking... Yes. Whole different thing comes about in terms of my way of thinking. Rhythmically, I'm thinking one way. Harmonically, I'm thinking another way according to what I'm, you know, I'm trying to, the effect I'm trying to create. Right. So the idea is to memorize what sounds like what. Right. And so when you feel like this, you go back to what you remember and you put it all together. I see. You say certain parts of the scale give you certain types of brightness, certain mm -hmm. parts of the scale give you a certain kind of blueness. Right. We're well, this, this helps compensate for uh, not having all those experiences or having all those experiences like you were lucky enough to have, of really having to interpret a song or whatever, this way you have to kind of like interpret on your own. Yeah. Come up with ideas and tra train yourself to think in those ways. But of course, you've got to have all the tools there. Oh, certainly. Now, you, do you always recommend, I mean, do you always teach in, in the, the, the picking style, in the, in the upright, you know, the bass player's style with fingers? Basic, fingers, basic fingers, list. Absolutely. As opposed to using a flat pick. A lot of bass players these days use picks. I never, um... I associate um, the flat pick with the um, basically playing a certain. It gives you the ability to play things like right. Tremble. Okay, very evenly. Right. Okay, you know. This is one finger. I'm using two fingers. There's a certain unevenness. Now I prefer mm -hmm. to hear it, the way I hear the bass. I like to hear it in an uneven sense. Mm -hmm. It's like somebody walking. Like one leg is always longer than the other. <laughs> so it's not like a, a smooth thing. So you have a little kind of like lilt to it. Mm -hmm. So I prefer playing with the fingers because you have this kind of inequity between the fingers that give you a different sound, give it a different right. rhythmic thing also. Mm -hmm. So pick playing, I associate with playing like if I just wanted a steady eighth note thing, right. where we're just the driving right. like that. Um, that's when I would advocate. I've tried playing with a pick at some point, but it didn't, um, I couldn't really get into it. Well, the it. way you use your fingers, it seems like it really facilitates that style you have of the, the pickups and the sudden, the jump style that you have of playing. That's almost not yes. possible with a pick. That's you know, it's, it's, it's brought about by the sheer 
physicality of what exactly what, what with you're the fingers. Doing. It yeah. leads you, it gives you that. Each physical aspect gives you um, each physical approach gives you something else. Mm -hmm. You have to find the one that's going to give you the sound or the, uh, the sound for the style of music that you're going for at that particular time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, what about uh, fingerboard exercises? Do you have any for oh, stretching, yeah. for, for developing uh, some technique? Oh, yeah. Once again, this depends upon um, how you hear the instrument. Like, here's one that I, li that I like to do. I've been doing this a lot lately. And it, it employs um, keeping your fingers down all the time. Okay. So, in other words, instead of playing, I can play the same line. I played that moving my fingers, and that's like a lot of people play that way. But the way I would play it would be smoothly, where I would keep, I wouldn't move my fingers until they were absolutely necessary from the move. So I play it in this manner. me to play like Phil's um, yeah. figures rhythmically because this this note, if I'm playing this particular finger down, mm -hmm. I might be holding like the fifth of the chord. Now, well, you're pedaling it more, too. I'm There's pedaling more, it. It sounds more legato. It's, it's a different style. Yeah. So if I'm doing something like... Right. I'm able to combine the com 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 combine the legato ness of with the rawness of this. Right, right. It's a question answer. It's like a question answer thing. So I have two different sounds happening. That's great. And I have a smooth phrase against a rough phrase. Mm -hmm. And I I use this um this is where technique comes in terms of developing a particular style. This right. is part of my style to um play things like this. That it comes from the technique of playing, doing that, so I do this across the string. So you get that kind of facility. So by keeping all your fingers down, the closer your fingers are to the string, you know, the quicker you can put them on the next string, as opposed to them being up in the air dancing around. Okay. You have to come from out of space to, hit, to get to the string. Right. Well, why don't we let's, let's play a little of that groove. I couldn't help but feel some of that while you're playing it so all right I'd like to hear where you go with that okay
A bit of Memphis soul stew there. Yep. It's the renowned Jerry Jamat lick from that song. Now, how did that develop? I mean, obviously, this is one of your most famous patterns. And from what I understand, the original studio version that uh, King Curtis did, which you weren't on, I think it was Tommy, Tommy Cogbill. Cogbill. Now, it was a whole different story. And then you guys played it live and took it to a whole other direction. And uh, I was sort of simulating the Cornell Dupree guitar part on there. And uh, that, again, is a classic example of just laying down the bass is almost the lead instrument on that tune to a certain yeah, degree. Yeah, we developed it that it came out that way because basically the original line um, was, I think, it was basically this. And Tommy, um, we stayed right there for the whole record, basically. That was Tommy playing. Um, and it was much like um, in the same brag, it was another song that Wilson Pickett had done, Funky Broadway, I think. Same bass player? That was um, Funky Broadway, when something like that. Mm -hmm. And it's practiced it's just the same line, basically. You just took that as an took intro, that rhythm. and then you just went right into that whole right. other thing. Right, so that was where that was coming from, because he recorded mm -hmm. that first. And so mm -hmm. when we did it, um, I combined that, you know. When it came time for him to introduce me, I took it to another, I went to another style. I went to like That's right. a Latin band, thing. That's right. And it was the band introduction, that's too. It was, it was exactly. your thing first, and then Cornell or whoever, right. Mm -hmm. right. And then the drums Bernard, came in. Right, mm -hmm. right. So I, um, coming from um, having been brought up in New York, I had a chance to play a lot of um, Latin American music. Uh -huh. And so this line. I see. It's kind of, it's really, um, it's coming from. Tuna bass line, so I just add a little more rhythm to it and mm -hmm. came out. And then the little skips comes from playing like um, playing like jazz. Right. right. So the combination of playing that, so I had this. Say 
I'm coming from, that, um, that skip thing where you're skipping across the strings. But it's amazing, you know, I mean, it's easy now, in retrospect, to analyze it. Oh, yeah. But it just, it, I'm sure it just, just came. Happened. It just happened. It just now happened. now we're able to say where, you know, those little mm -hmm. bits and pieces came from. And uh, it's an important thing. I mean, like, people these days tend to, you know, learn in bits and pieces. And, and the idea is to really develop your own style, let it all, you know, just, mm -hmm. just grow together. Um, I think is, is the key. I think and experience and um, having been around different styles makes it easy to incorporate mm -hmm. ideas. I'm playing what I, what I feel, but right. it's based on what I remember in terms of creating a feel, what it takes to get that kind of energy and mm -hmm. the kind of moves to make to do it, mm -hmm. or I can do it, you know, several different ways. Right. But I always like to have many ways of doing, capturing the same idea so I can, it doesn't get boring. Also, one of the great things that you do is, is we can be jamming on something and you could there'd be an implied new groove in there and we'll just, we'll suddenly shift, you, you can shift really subtly into mm -hmm. it and, and change. Just turn it up that, a notch. Turn it up a notch yeah. and change it or, or whatever. And that's, that's something that, you know, a bass player can do so subtly and just before you know it, everybody is swinging in that direction. That's right. Um, you can do that in blues, you can do that in, in funk, anything. Anything. You know? I think what does that, at least from my stand, I do it both harmonically and I do it rhythmically. Mm -hmm. Like I'll, um, say if I'm playing a line like um, something, let's, well, let's, I'll just make up a line yeah. now. Yeah, okay. okay. Um, there's four notes. Right. Let's walk this line. And once again, like I did before in the other um, example, what I'm, gonna, what I'm gonna do is embellish on these four notes by as sometimes leaving the line to play a pickup or leading in the field. This is basically what I'm always doing once I establish a line. I embellish it in that manner. Okay. And that's about all you really can do. Mm -hmm. You know, to, you're gonna, to maintain this line, mm -hmm. I have to keep it going but add to it by playing the pickup leading in the field. Mm -hmm. So I'll play. Leading. Rhythm. See what what's great about that is for a lead player, you're defining sections too. Exactly, you're defining Making it. Phrases. You help 
you're, you're, you're creating a piece, you're creating a song there. It gives you a different framework in which to build on. Mm -hmm. even, playing, even playing the same notes by changing the rhythm of those notes, mm -hmm. it's, I'm correct, I can create, a, I can create a, a chorus or a verse or a bridge just mm -hmm. by playing the same chord now. We play one chord. Right, one chord. Say, which is the hardest thing to do is to make something interesting on one harmonic structure That's right. That's a good and make it last. Good and make it develop. Follow. Right. I find it's the best because when you once you change, go to another chord, automatically you're going to another level. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the ear takes you there, mm -hmm. and this is like an automatic procedure, like changing a gear in a car. Right. But this way, it has to be done always internally. Right. I'm always trying to do something with what I'm working with, what I have, and expanding upon it. Well, again, it goes back to what I was saying. It to me, it, it really is like from the start, it's a solo. It's like if, if the whole band were playing that and suddenly to break down and leave you alone, the audience could be transfixed on still that line and then em the embellishments upon it as a bass solo. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be right away up here doing oh, all no. this stuff. You wanna, you I would want to build, I mean, and build you can, it up. You can get fancy. I've seen you do it. <laughs> I've seen you do some of the tap-ons and the hammer-ons and things like that. And yeah, I know you have some tricks. Maybe you could show a few things where you do the chords. Oh, I'll play a note play. here. I'll embellish it that way. You see, right. I, I right. love playing low notes. I'll do right. things with this hand. It's the first Eddie Van Halen of the bass. I want you to know. Right <laughs> yes, because I like to keep the bass notes going. Some lines you can play um, where I can sacrifice the bass. Like, like when I play um, Roger's favorite tune, City Blues. Yeah. When I play, I like the fire. Um, is that right key? Now see, there's no bass. It's like I'm playing a like I'm playing a rhythm guitar part. Exactly. You see, and when I go into a line, I'm playing. Um, right. So I'm holding this low note, and I'm playing the rhythm on top of that. So I'm still hearing the low. Note. I like to hear a low note, mm -hmm. you know, coming from the bass. I always think, you know, that's my main function is to cover that spectrum of the sound register. Right. So, so I have... Um, right. See? That's from a song of your City Blues. City Blues. people mm -hmm. know to listen for it. Um, yeah, and that's, well, that's an amazing thing, because you're actually pedaling something, and you're, you've, that's to facilitate, you're playing in A sharp or B flat, mm -hmm. and you're, that's to facilitate the, the horn players, right? Yes. And most guitarists or bass players would usually think of if you're going to pedal a note, hey. you're going <laughs> to stay in good old A for yeah. Arlen, right? Or, or you know, <laughs> D or G, you know, I love those open sure. things. Sure. But you choose, you know, you, you play in a lot of these more, like, out keys for us guitar players, okay. but that's great stuff, but still, but you've, you know, got a technique there of pedaling even in a key like that. Yeah. All right, Jerry, we were talking about styles before, and I know you were talking about all the influences, and of course, they're infinite. Um, we've been playing a lot of styles together over the years, and uh, how would you define, you know, the differences to a student or in terms of being able to, to cover a lot of different styles for studio work and, and things mm -hmm. like that? I mean, where should we start with that? Well, a basic understanding of what creates a style mm -hmm. is necessary. That way they can get a style in its original form and see how it's been mixed with others to form different styles of music. Like mm -hmm. basically you have your blues, right? you have jazz, you have um, rock, you have rhythm and blues, mm -hmm. you have the Afro-Caribbean um, Latin thing, you know. Um, these, I find, your, your, your basic styles, mm -hmm. and they come to all together to create what I call pop music, which is a combination of everything sure. that people want to hear. Okay, so um, each style has a definite rhythmic pattern and harmonic structure, okay? And say, for instance, I was playing, like, um, blues, okay? okay? Play. Okay, I'm playing, like, bluesy blues, traditional blues. Let's say the one change. Let's get this establish the feeling. Okay? Right. 
So that's your basic, and that was like, it comes from like that rhythm of one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. Shuffle. It's basically a slow shuffle. All your, 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 um, your shuffles, your blues, even jazz, they break down the beat in terms of like three parts of the beat. Right. One, two, and it felt like, like one, three, one, three, one, three, okay? Um, right. If I would play this in the same, the same line and make it more um, rhythm and bluesy, I would play, um, I'm playing more, I'm playing now, I'm playing a 16th note feel. I'm mm -hmm. playing one E and the two E and the three and the four E and the one, you see? So I'm going from the triplet to like the 16th note, which gives it more R&B feel as okay. opposed to the triplet thing from the, um, the blues. Right. If I was going to make this line into a jazz line, I would still have the shuffle mm -hmm. feeling, but the harmony now becomes more expansive because I'm playing in a more ex expressive medium. It's, it's a freer medium, so I'm playing the same line, which was... So I play in a jazz idiom. Walking it more. While walking. But it's still coming from one, two, three, one, two, three. That's going to the change, back to one again. Not so much rhythm. You see the little rhythm here and there. Right, right. But not the constant rhythm of. Right. You see? Right. This is looser, so I can play. Right, right. I can put subtle. the rhythm any place. Yeah, exactly, subtle. Mm -hmm. Sure. See? There's so much implied. You know, that's the thing, you know. If I were to play this, say, the same progression as a Latin progression, I would play, um... I'm trying to keep the same tempo. Um. Now with this, I'm using the 16th note rhythm. Mm -hmm. One e and the two e and the three e and the four e and the one e and the two e and the three e and four e and the you see. Yeah. Same right. notes, but now the rhythm's change, which gives it that particular style. Okay. Let's see, what did I miss? I got the, um, okay, rock. Sure. More eighth notey. Same line. Same notes, so I'm now playing it in a rock treatment. Right. Different right. feel complete because right. I'm playing with it. Slow it down now. You know, I mean, it's infinite, I mean, the kind of things you can do. Also, you know, what you're showing is, is very simple to, to most people, but I think that a lot of people have to really work on making it musical, okay? Making something like that really be that music, be, be rock and roll and be mm -hmm. blues or country or whatever at that time, you know, to really feel that. Feel you know? it, A yeah. lot of people may only be, be able to play in one feel, it's you know? True. And uh, do you work a, a lot with your students on that kind of oh, thing? Oh, yes. Basically, giving them what the components are. You know, because yeah. each, like I said, each one has a particular rhythm. So you lock into that rhythm and you start creating phrases within that rhythmic right. feeling. Right. The eighth note right. feeling, the sixteenth note feeling, the triplet feeling. And what about uh, reggae now? Okay, the same line. Uh, same line, maybe, yeah. Okay, and I'm going to probably play a different place on the instrument because I can. Um, Mm, okay. <coughs> Not too much. No. Right.
I did there is to, um, reggae is so wide open. Some mm -hmm. people say don't play on a downbeat. But here's a case where I played the bass note of the chord on the, uh, 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 on the, one, two, on the second and third beat. And the pickup was the downbeat. So I have one, two, three, three. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, so that's the idea. That's a, the main thing is leaving those holes. There's a lot of space, and guitars is always. That's why I went to the typical. Mm -hmm. uh, right, well, fit right there's always in. that in there, and there's, there's a, some country influence also in in reggae. That's why those kind oh, of guitar yeah. parts exist. Oh yeah, know? yeah. Because I know they love country music in Jamaica. So. Oh, that's what they used to get. That's the closest thing they can get was love music in the south. That's right. So <laughs> I guess that's not yeah, an R and B. Yeah. So it's like the natural thing of the environment. Yeah. Now country, the same line in country. Again, it's the eighth note feel. One and two and three Nine. and four and one and two and. You can do a lot with that, mm -hmm. as long as you're aware of, a, of the idea of the rhythm and the placement of pickups and fills and lead-ins to create a phrase, mm -hmm. you can create within any style of music. That's the whole ball game basically there. Mm -hmm. Then the other the idea of like hearing something, okay, yeah. where did I get this line from? Okay, that's the pentatonic scale. It also um, spells out... A, a six chord, a major six chord, which is something that you can hear easily, so therefore you're making a melodic statement that's very accessible to right, the listener, sure, sure. the other musician, so it's catchy at that point. Mm -hmm. So I try to f I pick out notes that are familiar to people's ears and then, you know, turn them around rhythmically mm -hmm. to give it a fresh approach. Now, if you're soloing, and I know you're a great soloist, how do you, do you take it from that point? Where do you, where do you go? Obviously, you're of the school, I, I've heard you take a lot of solos, where you really keep in mind the melody of the song, where the song is coming from mm -hmm. in your solo. And I think that's an important thing to keep in mind, too. Mm -hmm. Maybe there's something you could demonstrate uh, for our people out there. In terms okay. Of, of that, you know, establishing a theme and then a solo that might occur, that, that you might improvise. Based upon the theme. Okay, okay so I'm, I'm going to play the same, um, same chord that Scott finished playing, we were okay. working on. Um, I think about the style. What style are you talking about? That's the, the, okay, the what style, style. The style. The style. The style. The music that you're playing is to determine what kind of. Right, well, let's say play okay. Also. Let's say it's a, a, a blues thing. A blues thing. Yeah. Okay. What I would do um, when I jump into a solo, it's like whatever I heard last or whatever, because that occurs to me at the time, point of time when it occurs is what I come up with. When I usually okay. since I'm be playing the bass line for the most of the rest of the song, I want to have something that's going to depart from what I'm what I was playing. And the bass. So therefore, I was I was playing these notes. Mm -hmm. I might want to use that in the solo. I might want to start someplace else to give it a whole different picture right away. Mm -hmm. Like maybe like sh the shock the shock idea. Mm -hmm. Come out, you know. I might step out. Step out really quickly, or I might work out work my way out slowly. Okay. You know. So if I work my way out slowly, I come from okay. I stepped out. Right, that, exactly. That one note. Right, right. You see, as opposed to these notes were all mellow within the chord, okay, mm -hmm. kind of like, you know. We were establishing a rhythmic thing. A rhythmic thing, then a melodic sense. Sing, yeah. Then I step out with something else, mm -hmm. and I'll take that from that approach. I can go from here. That's the fifth of the chord, mm -hmm. which I naturally hear. Mm -hmm. Another note I like to hear is the, the flat seven. So my next, maybe my next thing might be based upon. Okay, so I'm, t I'm stretching the, the ear, I'm stretching the mm -hmm. sound so it's going up in terms of intensity. So I'll keep going up the chord, mm -hmm. 
from the root to the third to the fifth to the seventh, or right. you know, keep to establish this kind of ascend, ascending field. Right, right. Well, it's incredible because I mean, you really, I hear that that you're actually still picking each note. You know, I mean, like like going back to your 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 training, your early training on upright, and uh, I don't hear much of the. You know, uh, there's a little bit of bending. I don't hear much slides or hammer ons or anything. It's like every note is being is being picked. You know, which is of course a, you know a good way of approaching things mm -hmm. and developing technique and, and all that. But I know you do the other stuff. I know you do some string bending as well. And, yeah, if I know, do it as I as I hear it. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly as you hear it. I use a lot of hammer ons. Right. I, do, I do a lot of that. Um, right, but your left hand is so strong. It sounds like you're picking it. It, it yeah. does. It does. It's it's deceiving. Cause <laughs> That's a hammer yeah. on. Pull offs. Yes, it's very deceiving. It's like a combination of my right hand and my left hand. Mm -hmm. But it's not just notes. I'm expressing the notes as uh, for that particular phrase the way I feel them and I'll do it physically to get the sound that I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. You know, because sound is most important. Well we're just about having to wrap up this session. You're kidding. We I, gotta, feel, I gotta I feel come bad back again. About, well, we have to come back again, but I want to know, <laughs> do you have, a, have any uh, uh, final words of advice to the students out there before we play out and do a little blues together? I think the most important thing for anybody to learn is to um, learn patterns. Um, patterns being any um, specified grouping of rhythm or notes that you're going to stick to. Um, for instance, like say like a pattern of thirds would be, but say if I would go up the scale of playing in thirds. Okay, all thirds. That's a pattern. Mm -hmm. And I do that same pattern starting on another note. See? And go up to here. Knowing where you are in the scale so you can keep that same pattern of thirds going. Then the same thing happens rhythmically. You gotta play um. Keeping that same rhythmic pattern. So you wanna be able to analyze it, recognize a pattern so you can do the same thing on any chord you wanna do, or take the same harmonic structure. Helpful in studio work. Oh, you know. yeah. For transposition, it's wonderful because yeah, right. you can take something in a, a, a new key right. and you know what you're playing so you can transpose it quickly. Well, Jerry, it's just been a pleasure, an honor working with you and playing with you again. And let's, let's go out on some blues. All right. Which key you want to do it in? Why don't we do it in uh, A? I want to A it? Okay, we'll A it. <laughs> a for Arlen. <laughs> okay. Take it. A three, four. <laughs>